Now the latest from ITV News Meridian with Fred Dynage and Sangeeta Barbara. Good evening, welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines in the South. Tumble dryer recall. The couple who are terrified their machine will catch fire. So what's the advice if you're worried? Your house here! Your house here! Unexpected protests in the council chamber as Portsmouth debates cuts to vital services. She's just mad about Harry, the mum who has an absolutely wizard collection of Harry Potter memorabilia. And top of the flips and the flops, how the South celebrated Pancake Day. Good evening to you. They are faulty, carry safety warnings and are in need of repair. Tonight, though, there is growing criticism over the time it's taking to check one and a half million fire risk tumble dryers. One family from Surrey lost their home when their dryer burst into flames. Since we told you their story, thousands of you have contacted us to say you're still waiting for appliances to be checked and you're worried. Well, the company Whirlpool, which includes Hotpoint, Creda and Indesit models, has written to more than one and a half million customers. It expects to contact almost two million more by the end of the month. 860,000 people have registered for repairs. The company says 114,000 cases have been dealt with. It admits it could take 10 weeks to get a date, and that's just for an engineer's visit. Well, you've all been, thank you very much, responding to our story on our Facebook and Twitter pages, and we'll have uh, details of what you should do in just a minute. First, though, Mel Bloor has been to meet some more families. Can you pick up another one, are you? Caring for her husband is a full-time job for pensioner Peggy Collis and sleepless nights are the last thing she needs. I'm so worried that if we were unlucky enough for our tumble dryer to catch fire, I'd never be able to get my husband out of the property. I haven't slept sort of since I had to know that this has been affected. Like so many, Peggy has been told it will be at least two months before an engineer can visit her home and inspect her tumble dryer. Customers are being advised their machines are safe to use in the meantime, so long as they're not left unattended and are regularly cleared of fluff. With the amount of washing that my husband has because of being disabled, he's you know, got to have his things changed regularly on his sheets that I have to use the tumble dryer to get everything dry. I get sort of butterflies in the stomach and uh, I'm scared, really, to put the tumble dryer on. Peggy is not alone. Natasha Garnham also has a machine on the recall list. She knows only too well the devastation a faulty tumble dryer can cause. Her mum, dad and brother have been left homeless after their machine caught fire last weekend. Obviously, with everything that happened to my mum's, I um, contacted Hotpoint um, and they told me that somebody would come out and repair my tumble dryer. They turned up on Saturday afternoon and took my whole tumble dryer apart and then decided they didn't have the right part for it. They said they'll contact me in eight weeks to arrange for the part because I had to order it in because they were out of stock. Um, and they, then someone called, contacted me yesterday and told me they'll come next week. Now that the back of this machine has been removed, you can actually see some burn marks. And what they think might be happening is that fluff's escaping through the back of the drum, which is then hitting the heating elements and, in some cases, catching fire. I haven't used it at all since, like, anyway, I've been hanging the washing out and that. It's getting on top of me at the moment. It's getting too much. Peggy and Natasha are just two of Whirlpool's customers who feel let down. And there are thousands more. Mel Bloor, ITV News. Well, Whirlpool's put out a number of statements which are on our website and says the safety of our customers is our number one priority. It says it investigates all reported incidents thoroughly. Well, in our London studio is Emma Apter from the charity ESF, Electrical Safety First. Emma, thanks for joining us. Whirlpool says it's OK to keep using these machines that are on recall, just don't leave them unattended. Should people be worried about that? 
Ordinarily, our advice would be to follow what the manufacturers are saying to you. However, there have been a number of incidents where people have used their, their machines after being given that advice and they've caught fire. So we would now urge people to stop using those products until they've had a manufacturer's engineer come and check them. That might be an issue because of how long it's taking them to get out to you, but it's not worth taking the risk. We know that there are fires being caused by them. It's really not the risk to, to, to carry on using them. You see, we've been inundated by worried viewers. You've had lots of emails and messages too. What are people saying? They're, they're just really worried about the advice they're being given. They're seeing across the papers that people are being told to carry on using them but, be, be, but to make sure they're being supervised. But they're seeing that, that the products are still catching fire. And understandably, if they're being told that they can carry on using them, they really don't know what's going to happen. I've been telling people when they've been emailing and phoning in that they really shouldn't take the risk, don't use the, the appliances, make sure that you stop using it until the engineer has been out to check that your machine is safe. Your message to Whirlpool, Emma, is what? You need to take control of the situation, completely understand that you don't know how many appliances are a risk of fire. However, people are unsure of what to do. Safety concerns have to come first. And while there might be lots of machines that you need to get out to check, you need to be putting out more guidance to consumers. Emma Apter, good advice. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. We've got a helpline number coming up, but first, on our Facebook page, we've had 70,000 hits on this story. And Liz Riggs from Romsey says, I have a faulty one and seven people in the family to wash and dry clothes for. We were told they would get to us as soon as possible. Julie Williams from Newport on the Isle of Wight says, I had an email saying up to eight weeks before being given a date for an engineer to come. It should be a free replacement for safety's sake. Edward Jesuski from Littlehampton says, we reported our hot point dryer last October, just received an email stating that they hope to fix it by March, so fingers crossed. Indeed, and Tracy Martin from Seaford says they should put something in place in electrical stores to allow us to exchange our dryers. Well, we've been asked to put out a number for those who do not have access to the website. You can contact Whirlpool on this number, and it is 0800 151 0905, 0905, sorry, I'll do that again. And the recall refers to models manufactured between April 2004 and October 2015. And for more on that story and details of the models, plus links to websites, do go to our own website, itv.com forward slash Meridian. We will, of course, keep you fully updated on this story. The jury in the trial of a man accused of murdering Georgina Edmonds have been hearing his police interviews. Matthew Hamlin was arrested two years after the 77-year-old was killed at her country cottage at Brambridge near Winchester. He was asked about his drug taking, his whereabouts on the day the pensioner was found and whether he'd ever been into her home. 36-year-old Matthew Hamlin denies murder. From Winchester Crown Court, Andrew Pate sent this. In the police interviews, Matthew Hamlin was asked a series of questions around whether he'd ever been to Fig Tree Cottage, the home of Georgina Edmonds. His reply on a number of occasions was, not to the best of my knowledge, no. He was later asked, on a percentage scale, how certain are you that you did not have any involvement of a sexual nature with Georgina Edmonds on the 11th of January 2008? He replied, on a percentage in the 90s. Detective Constable Bolton said, in the 90s. Matthew Hamlin continued, yeah, high 90s I'd imagine. I don't think anything's ever 100%, so you know. Mr Hamlin was asked about this again in a later interview and said it's more than 90%. I'm as certain as I possibly can be. 77-year-old Georgina Edmonds was found at her home in Brambridge on January the 11th, 2008. The prosecution says she was beaten with her marble rolling pin. In the interviews, Matthew Hamlin was told, you are forensically linked to the murder weapon. What do you say to that? He replied, very surprised and I'd like to know how. Later he said, I can't see how, so I'd like to see the evidence. The 36-year-old from Bishop Soak was also shown CCTV of someone trying to use Georgina Edmonds' bank card. 
He said that person isn't him. Mr Hamlin said he used to be a cocaine user and that on occasions people had tried to put pressure on him to pay for the drugs he'd used. But he said he was never in any fear of any drug dealers. Matthew Hamlin denies murder. The case continues. Andrew Pate, ITV News, Winchester. Meanwhile, detectives investigating the murder of an elderly couple at their bungalow near Chichester are still waiting to question a man. The couple in their 70s were found dead in a fire at their home at Chinham on Saturday. A post-mortem found they both died from neck and head injuries and police think they were attacked before their home was set alight. A man who is known to the couple is in hospital being treated for serious burns. A protest held at the start of Portsmouth Council's budget meeting today as campaigners angry at plans to cut domestic abuse services released ticker tape into the council chamber. The meeting, outlining £11 million of savings this year, is still underway this evening. Well, we know council tax is likely to go up by almost 4% from April and it is estimated around 100 council jobs will go. Our reporter Sam Holder is live for us now outside Portsmouth Guildhall. And Sam, to put it mildly, lively scenes there today. Yes, well, the budget meeting is still ongoing in the Guildhall behind me, and it's been a fiery afternoon. The meeting itself was hit by protests. Demonstrators opposed to proposed cuts to domestic violence services released confetti and poppers in the chamber itself and caused the meeting to be stopped for around 10 minutes. And before that, there were protests outside the Guildhall, and I spoke to one of the organisers from the group Sisters Uncut. For women fleeing an abusive relationship, there are so many barriers to leaving that services to support women to leave are absolutely life-saving. Women need access to safe housing, they might need access to legal advice, they might need access to welfare benefits. Well, the council says it has found the £130,000 necessary to keep domestic violence services going for this year at least, although it's not clear what will happen in the future. Other proposals tonight include raising council tax by the maximum amount of 3.99% for the next four years. Here's the leader of the council, Donna Jones. Before we put that council tax proposal forward today of that 3.99%, we consulted with people extensively. Over 2,400 people across the city responded to our budget consultation throughout September and October, and they told us that they wanted to pay more council tax to protect their public services. Well, it looks like with the increase to council tax that frontline services have avoided major cuts for this year. But with the council having to find an extra £24 million by 2020, there could be serious cuts in the future. Sam, thank you very much indeed. Meanwhile, Pool Council wants to close all of its town centre public toilets to save almost £100,000 a year. The public loose at Chapel Lane, Key Visitor Centre, Key Watch Station and at the Kingland Road bus station will close. Councillors are proposing a community toilet scheme where the public can access loos in local businesses, whether they're paying customers or not. And for more on all of our stories, you can head to our website, itv.com forward slash Meridian. You can call us, the number's on the screen, or why not get in touch via Facebook or send us a tweet at ITV Meridian. There's been a call for businesses affected by flooding to have access to more affordable insurance policies. Yes, last night MPs held a debate in the Commons asking the government and insurance industry to work more closely to find a solution. Well, it comes as a new government-backed scheme for flooded homeowners is introduced. Matt Price takes up the story. That will all assist the drying process. At Sue Eccles Hotel, the cost of repairs will run into tens of thousands of pounds. Loss adjusters assessing the damage after swathes of water started gushing in when a nearby river burst its banks. It was about three and a half foot of water throughout the ground floor of the hotel. You have to pick yourself up and you've got to rebuild your business. You know, we're maintaining the payroll for 76 staff. We're retraining while we close. We're, you know, sending them out to other places to look at how they work. 
Bookings have been cancelled, bedrooms ripped out. Sue was insured, but putting things right is a long, slow process. And their small businesses and independent traders are the lifeblood and the beating heart of our area. Last night, MPs held a debate on whether more needs to be done to help businesses secure flooding insurance. The conclusion was for a discussion between ministers and industry experts to take place today. I am hosting a round table with Biba, with ABI, with the Federation for Small Businesses and a dozen other stakeholders exactly to talk through the concrete, detailed issues involved in providing serious insurance for businesses. In Winchester two years ago, measures were put in place to try and hold back the river Itchen. But for those homeowners who were flooded then, there is now some good news. A new government-backed scheme makes it possible for those hit by flooding to secure an affordable policy. Flood Re takes the flood risk away from insurers and is funded by a £180 million tax on the insurance industry. It uses those funds to pay the claims of people that are affected by flooding. Uh, on those policies that are sent to it by the insurance industry. So because Floodree is paying the claims, uh, the, uh, pr the cost of those claims doesn't have to be built into the price charged by insurers, and so the prices reduce. Some MPs want this scheme extending to companies too, but the Association of British Insurers argues there's no need. We have not been provided with any evidence that suggests that the same systemic problems affect the business community. Now, of course, firms of all shapes and sizes get hit by floods, and it's devastating for firms as well as homeowners, but those companies should be able to get flood insurance on the open market. Back at a hotel, Sue has a heart set on reopening this summer after months of rebuilding and redecorating. She's hoping the building can be reinsured, but hates to think what might happen if the river breaches once again. Matt Price, ITV News. More news now from right around our region and a new wearable sleeve for patients who've suffered a stroke is going to be developed and trialled by scientists at the University of Southampton. The wireless technology is aimed at helping stroke sufferers track their recovery on a tablet whilst also allowing therapists to guide their rehabilitation programme. Councillors in Oxford will meet tonight to discuss plans to improve the appearance of new student flats at Port Meadow. Oxford University has proposed screening the controversial building with trees and changing their colour. But campaigners say it would do nothing to repair the damage done to views of the city and the flat should be reduced in height. Police investigating burglaries at a hotel in Bournemouth have released new CCTV of two men they want to trace. Eight rooms were broken into at the Miramar Hotel on East Overcliff Drive on Saturday, January the 23rd. Money, gold earrings and a diamond necklace were stolen. Gatwick has been named as one of the fastest growing airports in Europe. The Airport Council made the announcement following the airport's busiest ever January with 2.5 million passengers. Its chief executive, Stuart Wingate, says he believes the airport is now ready for expansion. It is 6.18. Thank you very much for being there for us. The ITV Evening News continues for the national and the international news at 6.30. Let's now get a quick preview to London. Mark Austin. Our main story this evening, the head-on crash between two high-speed trains in Germany. It happened in remote countryside southeast of Munich. At least nine people are dead and 80 injured. There's to be a new inquest into the death of toddler Poppy Worthington just weeks after a judge said she'd been sexually assaulted by her father just before she died. And against all odds, Lara finds a bone marrow donor with a little help from the internet. Join Mary Nightingale and me at 6.30. Now, whether you're a fan or not, I'm sure you'll have heard of the wizard Harry Potter. Well, one woman is such a fanatic that she decided to recreate the magic of Hogwarts in her own home. In her own home? In her own home. Amazingly, her I'm collection... I'm scared, what are you going to do? <laughs> her collection of wizarding memorabilia is thought to be one of the biggest and rarest in the UK. It has to be seen to be believed, so we sent our own muggle, Mike Griffiths, along to take a look. When does a hobby become a way of life?
In Victoria McLean's case, her passion for all things Potter began more than a decade ago. After reading the first book, I fell in love completely. I loved it so much. I wanted more, I wanted to hear more, I wanted to see more, and I, I was finding out that more cultures, more countries were bringing out some incredible, incredible items. Jap uh, Japan, uh, everywhere, were just doing some fantastic items. And I just wanted them, I wanted to be able to look at them and have them with me, have them in my collection. And it's just grown from there, piece by piece by piece. Oh. So here it is. Here it is. And grown it has. Victoria now has one of the largest collections of Harry Potter memorabilia in the UK. Anything Harry Potter and, and I'm, I'm happy. A lot of items I bought when they first came out as well. So they were the lowest price of recommended retail price. So obviously those items now have gone up in value. Along the way, she's had a Harry Potter themed wedding with props she built herself. And she's rubbed shoulders with a number of stars from the films. When I met um, Tom Felton, who plays Draco Malfoy on the set of This Morning, which I filmed last March, um, he was completely different to what I'd expect. Obviously, he plays this mean, nasty bully in Harry Potter. And when I said to him, I said, can I give you a hug? He said, of course you can. He said, I'm not like that other guy at all. And he was just utterly delightful. One person she hasn't met so far is the book's author, J.K. Rowling. I did write to her, I have written to her a few times, telling her, updating her on things I'm doing. I do get her assistant reply, but I have had her autograph sent to me in the post, which was amazing. With more productions from the Potter universe on the horizon, Victoria's collection shows no signs of stopping. Mike Griffiths, ITV News. Amazing. Now, even if there were more than a few flipping disasters, it really didn't matter. People right across the region have been enjoying Pancake Day races. Newbury staged its biggest ever event. 28 teams took part and hundreds of spectators crowded into Marketplace to watch. Afterwards, the mayor tossed pancakes from the town hall balcony to children below, a tradition since the 1870s. Fun was also had at Wimborne in Dorset as the town's now famous pancake race took place around the historic Minster Church. It was an occasion which many of the town's children will no doubt remember. Meanwhile, MPs, lords and journalists competed in the annual Westminster pancake race. A triumphant Tim Lawton, the MP for Worthing, was among the leading MPs who beat journalists and peers into second and third place. Well done to him. So now you know what your MP was doing today. Yeah, I know, but they've got important things to do. It's nice that they have a bit of fun. <laughs> yes, of course it is. Um, I like lemon and sugar. I don't know what Simon likes. Let's ask him. Oh, well, hang on, what do you cherries, like? Cherries and ice cream. Really? Yes. No, 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 banana ice cream syrup. That's really? Oh, you yeah. are so yeah. exotic. And I'm still putting off the January diet. But anyway, um, <laughs> yesterday, of course, you yes. wouldn't want to be flipping anything in that big, strong wind. No. Strongest winds we've seen since... The winter of 2013, I'll have you know. But well. some amazing pictures, images of Imogen have still been coming in. Look at this. Philippa Timms took this picture. Look, look at that wave yes. on wow. the Isle of Wight there. Isn't that incredible? That and is... Mark Rose took Whoa. this near the wow. derelict Fraser Gunnery Range oh, in East Be safe. Uh, the power yeah. of the sea. And that poor yeah. fellow there, probably still trying to dry out. Uh, <laughs> Dave Pitcher found a lovely place to have a sit down in Hove. <laughs> Oh, no, hang on, maybe not. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, no. And uh, speaking of relaxing, look at this. Sarah Oxford from Burgess Hill tweeted me a picture <laughs> of this one. Someone relaxing on Brighton Pier <laughs> yesterday. But look closer, relaxing on nothing. No. Look, there, that's just the wind just the holding wind. him up. That's but uh, what a difference a day makes, because today, look what turned up on my Twitter feed. No. no. Yep. Natasha and Martel Starling in Ride have made that. Not because it snowed, but because we had a hail-related incident. But uh, more time on their hands than they should have had, I would have thought, to build so one of those. So what's coming up? More wind, more hail, more like snow? What would you like? I'd like a bit of sunshine, sunshine and a nice crisp morning. I'll see what I can do. He's going to see what he can do. Let's find out if he is magical. Simon Parkin. That's us driving on, mm -hmm. us driving off in France, Ooh. and us outside a chateau. Aww. Driving to Europe, Eurotunnel Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather.
Well, thanks for all of the shower updates today and apologies if you found yourself underneath an unexpected hailstorm. Thankfully, things are a bit calmer over the next couple of days. The low pressure that's been driving the bad stuff clearing away and we get a ridge of high pressure developing down to the south and that means things are settled from tomorrow onwards. But by Friday, the next low pressure arrives and that's going to bring more wet and windy stuff. But back to tonight, largely dry to start with. It's through the early hours. We'll see a bit of patchy light rain developing. Temperatures quite nippy though, two or three degrees, but enough of a breeze to start stop frost from becoming an issue and the showers disappearing through the night so by the time we wake up tomorrow morning we should be dry fair amount of cloud at first but that's going to thin and break quite nicely and by the afternoon some decent spells of sunshine temperatures seven eight degrees still not desperately warm but not as cold as it has been and not as much breeze around either as for your high tide times you can see in pool around 20 past 10 in the morning quarter to 11 in the evening then a very chilly night to take us into thursday thursday may well start with a widespread frost and some freezing fog patches but once they've cleared dry and fine for the rest of the day ah euro tunnel the shuttle sponsors itv meridian weather now on tomorrow's program we go around the region to see how the junior doctors strike is affecting our hospital it's a 24-hour strike starting at 8 a.m tomorrow and is the second one to take place the last action in january resulted in hundreds of operations cancelled right across our region as part of the row over next co new contracts well the details tomorrow here at six in just a moment, we have the ITV Evening News with Mark Austin and Mary Nightingale. I shall have our late news around about 10.30, so do join me if you can. But for now, from the team here at ITV Meridian, thank you very much indeed for watching. Take care. See, See you, you later. From us all. Bye-bye.